Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. At 15 years old in 1989, he, along with four other black teenage boys, was arrested, accused of, and incarcerated for raping a white woman while she was jogging in Central Park, a crime they did not commit. Freed after nearly seven years behind bars, he's used his trauma as a means to empower and advocate for young black men and women in the arenas of social justice reform, political placement, and education. Please welcome the brave, the bold, and the unapologetically black, Youssef Salam. Yes. <laughs> wow. yes. It's such an honor yes. to meet you, sir. Oh my, my goodness. Well. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet oh. you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I like hugs too. I didn't yes. know, but you. Yes. you know. <laughs> yes, indeed. Have a seat right here. It's such a pleasure. I'm so yeah. happy that yeah. you oh. came down to the circle today. So let's jump right into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, how have you been able to manage the mm. global response since the movie uh, When They See Us has come out? And how are you navigating that now? I would say gently. Mm -hmm. I think that. Um, rising to the occasion that you realize that you were born on purpose yes. and you're starting to realize that purpose. You're starting to realize that you can add value to the world. You can use your platform for the greater good. Yes. You know. oh. Again, talking about when they see us, when you were approached about doing this movie, what were your first thoughts? What was the thing that came to your mind? I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. let's do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because the thing about it is that we had done a documentary and the documentary gave us our voices back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, what next? And the best thing that we could do next was to actually have this re-portrayal of us, whatever we did, everything that happened, be brought back to life. And yeah, I think these yeah. young actors that took our stories, you know, I mean, uh, shoot, mm. Angelou Ellis just, mm -hmm. she portrayed my mom. There, was scene, there, were, there were times where I was on set and I would see her and she would just get into character, and I was like, holy shucks, that's my Ooh, mom. Right, right. And it was so beautiful to see that, that strength, that power, that yeah. thing that I keep telling folks about, you know, she's my rock and my, you know, she's been in, she's been in my corner yes. since day one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I, I know you, because you have to relive so mm. much of this with, with, the, with the movie, the documentary, and your life's work, but yes. now you're saying it, I had to go through those, those things because it's my purpose. Yes. But when you look back sometimes, mm. when you were sitting in that jail cell, do you ever go back to any of those times? And if you do, where, what, what was that like? Or what is it like to relive some of that? So I remember it all. And when I look back, I can see the path. But when you're going through it, you right. can't. The only thing that you have to do is you have to keep on walking. They said when you're walking through hell, keep on walking. And if you don't do that, if you give up, then you, not only does your body become in bondage, but also your mind. You need to keep your mind free so that you can do what you need to do. When did you know you had this type of strength? Yes. Wow. I found out that we were all born with it. Mm. And I found out that in those quiet times, I would hear my grandmother, I would hear my mother, I would hear every elder that was mm. talking to me before. I would hear their advice. My grandmother would say things like, be still and listen. Mm -hmm. And to, to be able to really digest that, it became apparent, wow, this is, so, this is there's, there's, it looks like magic. It looks like luck. But really, it's laboring under correct knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's utilizing these skills, these things that you've been given to really turn lemons into lemonade. Oh my Ooh. gosh. Yeah. Oh, wow. We, we recently had uh, Brian Banks here at the show. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. And I have to ask this, as young, black, innocent boys in jail, how do you, how do you hold on to hope in a hopeless situation? How do you, how do you maintain a positive psyche in a moment like that? You have to think about yourself as your past, present, future self. You have to project yourself into your own future so that you know that as you sow these seeds that you will one day reap, that you know, I mean, I think about Nipsey Hussle all the time and I say, man, here's a young man who was sowing seeds of trees that he would never sit under the shade of. Oh mm. my God. But as we begin to think about ourselves and our future selves, it makes sense because instead of saying YOLO and living a reckless life, living mm -hmm. a careless life, we live a life on purpose. We live a life of value. And we live a life that we know that one day we'll be able to achieve this or our children's children's children will be able to reap the benefits of everything that we're doing right now. Yes, yes, you know, and yes. I think that that's the most important thing. Yes, and I think your children are doing the same thing. And as a father, how are you able to still do your life's work, but still shield them and protect them from what this world is like mm. and allow them to experience it at the same time? So, 
I tell my children all the time, I have seven girls and three boys. Nice. And I tell them all the time, since they were babies, stay on point. Yeah. You know, and they get it, they understand it um, more than I would have helped. And, and you know, it's just, it's, it's the, the difficulty is to shut off the story because if they're running around in the backyard, I'll catch myself and say, oh no, everything is safe, they're good, yeah. they're in my backyard. Yeah. You know, I can hear the cars coming, coming down the cul-de-sac because we live in you know, a quiet area and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's a lot safer. Yeah. But when I'm home, I like to kick my feet up and be father, mm -hmm. yes. be daddy, you know, yes. be, be um, I kind of turn it off a bit. Yeah. And then when I get back out in the world, I'm, I'm healed because I know what I'm doing it for. Yes. You know, yes. my children, not only for them, but realizing that they have to live in the world of a thought like Donald Trump, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, let's talk about your advocacy. Let's talk about your organization, Youssef Speaks. Yes. Uh, I have two young black men that I'm still raising. They're, they're in their 20s, but I'm, I feel like I'm still raising them because mm -hmm. you, you have to teach them every day, especially in the world we live in. What do you say to these young men and women through your organization? I think, I think a, a lot of it is encouraging them to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in prison, about six months in, somebody asked me, who was I? And I wrote it in my book of poetry. And um, that question, the answer to that question was, searching to find who has come a beautiful soul, a powerful one. Mm -hmm. And it's the realization and understanding that God created us and God took something of himself and placed it inside of us. And so our quest is to figure out who are we? And then yeah. once we find out who we are, we can live in that purpose, but we, we have to know that we were one of over 400 million options when our parents got together. Mm -hmm. And we made it, we swam the fastest. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we were born on purpose and with a purpose. And once we understand that, we can believe in ourselves. We can, we can turn off all of the negative uh, voices that are out there telling us that we're not worth anything. Therefore we produce worthlessness. Yeah. But we're worth everything, especially young people. They're the ones that are going to be the future movers and shakers of tomorrow. Oh, so my beautiful, goodness, beautiful, my goodness. beautiful soul. Oh, we've got more with Central Park Five soldier and survivor Yusef Salam. And the rest of the sisters are also going to join us with the conversation, so please stay with us. You don't want to miss this. Yes, you don't. You oh. don't. Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. As promised, activist, philanthropist, and history maker Yusef Salam mm -hmm. is back with us along with our sisters Selena and Quad joining the conversation. And Ms. Quad, you are going to kick things off for us. Yeah, I'm happy that you're here. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining Thanks us. God. It is truly it is, to be. It is it's, my it's, a, it's a blessing it's, to yes. have you here with us. It really is. We're gonna talk about the state of our country today. Yes. 24 hours, within 24 hours, there were two massive shootings, mm. El Paso, Texas, and then also Dayton, Ohio. What are your thoughts on how far gun control has, has not come, mm. okay? And then also how um, imminent hate crimes are? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Donald Trump being the head of this country, I think says a lot. It's not that him, he himself is the problem, but the thoughts that he continues to put out there in the world allows people to think that it's okay. Yeah. And so black bodies have been less valued. You know, uh, when the police come after us, they come after us as if they're slave catchers. Mm -hmm. They you know, do. And we look at the whole, the, the landscape of everything, and it becomes very apparent that, you know, we live in two very different Americas. One where you're afforded every um, option under the law, and the other way, you're not given any of those rights, you know? And I think that that's a real big problem, especially as we look at some of these manifestos that have emerged as these killings have happened, you know? And I think about that, but I also couple it and tie it, in, tie it into what happened in that church where that young yes. man, Dylan Roof, went in and mm -hmm. shot all of those parishioners. My God. And they arrested him. <laughs> they, they, they arrested him. I didn't say they killed him. Right. They arrested right. him. They, they, they captured him alive. Yep. And they, then they took him to dinner mm -hmm. before they sent him to prison. You know, and I think that when we look at what's happening in America, you could be a young Tamir Rice and police won't even ask a question, but when they see you with a, a, what they think is a gun, they just drive up and shoot you down. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mike Brown, you know. And, and you know, you said that the list goes on and on. Yes. Eric Gardner, uh, yes. Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, Khalif Browder, Philando Castile. When we sit and reflect on the killings of our young African American people, what comes to mind? You know, I know, like, for me personally, 
there's a hopelessness that happens. What stirs in your heart when you think of these slayings? And I call them slayings, yeah. that's exactly, these murders. So, so what comes to my mind immediately is they want us to live in fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And fear, if we understand it as an acronym, is false evidence appearing Being real. real. Yes. And so as we begin to understand that we have to live full, as my friend Les Brown says, mm -hmm. and die empty. Mm -hmm. We can't live and ask permission to live. We were here and we were born on purpose. And so therefore, we have to be able to just say, you know what, I want to give it all. I, wanna, I don't, I don't want to necessarily look at all of the rocks that are being thrown at us, which is the murders, the systemic racism, mm -hmm. the white supremacy, white male dominance, all of these you know, isms and destructive things that are constantly forcing us to hide mm -hmm. and duck for cover. We got to say no. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We have to be able to boldly put our shoulders to the grind and press forward because we are about maybe um, 50 plus years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and um, Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And we're still dealing with a lot mm -hmm. of those things. Mm -hmm. But I say that because we're, 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 the opportunity is that we're still in a young timeline. We haven't, this is not like eons. We are literally about to sh sh um, shift things into a, the right perspective, change things. I feel like when you look at the Central Park Jaga case, we went through everything that we went through because just as we were formed in our mother's stomachs, we were formed in the belly of the beast in order to attack the system as it appears today. Mm. And Do you think we're things. still going through civil rights? I know a lot of people say the civil rights is still not, I mean, it's, the movement is still moving. Yes. I think civil rights, human rights, all of the rights that we look for, you know, we hope that we have freedom, justice, and equality, but the reality is that um, to people who have always seen themselves in their privilege, mm. equality mm. looks like oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh. I think that that's something that mm. we have to truly understand from Message. that perspective. It's a, it's a vantage point. It's a thing where My God. the beautiful thing is that our, the, the, the world that we live in right now, this kaleidoscope of the family that, that represents the human family, um, the children of former slaves and the children of former slave owners want a different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's just like good cop, bad cop. There are a whole lot of good cops, but the spotlight is continuously shown on the bad cops. Yeah. Just like there are a whole lot of good people, but the spotlight is continuously shown on the evil. Yes. And they need us, they need us in order to participate. Mm -hmm. Mm. But we have to refuse. Mm. You, you talk about evil people, and there were a lot of evil people who wrote letters to you oh. while you were in jail. And you decided to not throw them away because of their uh, vitriol and, and, you know, just the, the hate. You saved some. Yes. Why? And this one in particular because you said it talked about time. This one, this one in particular because this, um, this empowers me to remember what we are up against. I can hide in plain sight, or I could jump in. And jumping in doesn't necessarily mean that I take a gun and I shoot white people. But what that does mean is that I teach and train the future generations mm -hmm. that we have to think about ourselves as our present, as our past, future, as our past, future, present self. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, as we merge those realities, here we are right now. What were we, and what do we want to become? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I look at this and I say to myself, this right here wanted me to duck for cover. This letter is telling me that 20 to 30 years from now, some people will never forget. And maybe the one time that I don't check my back is the one time that somebody might just be there to say hello. Mm -hmm. But the reality is this, that right there was a whisper into the darker enclaves of society. After Donald Trump said, bring back the death penalty, bring, bring back our police, we hadn't even gone to trial yet. Mm -hmm. We were already being judged in the court of public opinion. I got it. And so if you think about what they could have done, we could have become modern day Emmett Till's. They mm -hmm. wanted somebody to come into our homes, to drag us from our beds, to beat us to death, shoot us in the head as they did him and tie a cotton gin around our necks. Mm. But as they wrote in the papers, Pat Buchanan <coughs> kind of seized on that moment and he just went a step further. He went full on racist. Mm -hmm. mm. And what he said was, we should take the eldest one, Corey Wise, and hang him from a tree in Central Park. Mm -hmm. We should take the others and horse with them. Oh mind my God. you, mind you, dioxyribonucleic acid freed us. Mm -hmm. They found that we didn't do it because of this thing called DNA. DNA. Mm -hmm. That fingerprint that is individual to each and every one yes. of us. They found that we didn't do it because of that. 
And when they rechecked all of their evidence, my God. Do you forgive those people? Do you forgive the prosecutor? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, it is. Cause that's tough. So, <laughs> my, my, my good friend, my brother, Corey Wise, he says, you can forgive, but you must not forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reality of the matter is that what I want us to understand as a society, these folks built their careers off of our backs. Mm -hmm. These yeah. folks were able to live lavish mm -hmm. lives because of the, the trauma that they put us through. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so it's important to look at it from that vantage point that we want good prosecutors, we want good police officers, we want good everything, but the reality is that we keep having people who are overstepping the bounds of the law and all black bodies are the ones that are collateral damage, you know. You have this book, yes. can you talk about it briefly? <clears throat> yes, these books, actually I got a copy for each of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> these books were poems that I wrote while I was in prison. Ooh. Some of which I never edited, they just came to me and I wrote it down and I said, wow, what am I gonna do with this? One of the most famous poems in here is the poem that I said when I got uh, sentenced, at my sentencing, they said, do you have anything to say before we sentence you? And I stood up and I said this rhyme. Cause you know, back then there was always a message in the music and mm. always music in the message. And so that was my medium of, of, of communication. And I said this rhyme that not only talked about my case, but it also drew into the courtroom what happened to the young Yusuf Hawkins, you know, who was mm. murdered because of racism. Um, that rhyme was called, I Stand Accused. The very next day, the New York Post had a photo of my rhyme on the front page, and the headline said, Salam Baloney. Mm. You know, and you know, like they I said, in here are, are motivational things, things that I want people to understand, like we have the power to win. Yes. You know, I quoted Asada Shakur, and I kind of put my own twist on it, that we have to love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. But we have to understand that. They want us to live in a world of fear. They want us to live in a world of hopelessness. They want us to not be prepared. They want us to, to forget that they have thought about this thing that has gone on into our lifetimes where they still have their foot on our necks. Yusuf, thank you so much. My pleasure. For being here, sharing your message. <coughs> and living your purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank we you. appreciate you. Mm -hmm. uh, we and celebrate your resilience, peace. your amazing work. My God. And if you want more information about his story and his advocacy work, please visit YusefSpeaks.com.